Retrospection Radio presents Happy Halloween, everyone. Greetings. I'm the narrator. Welcome to the study. Today I will read to you a tale to delight, or perhaps cause of fright. <laughs> For the most wild yet most homely narrative which I'm about to tell, I neither expect nor solicit belief. <laughs> Sanity. A concept only humanity can conceive. The very thought of sanity is insane in and of itself. No animal in the kingdom understands the thoughts of sanity, save for one. And that one animal is capable of horrendous deeds. A man has recently been sentenced to death for an unspeakable crime. Mad! Am I not? And very surely do I not dream. But tomorrow I die. And today I would unburden my soul. My immediate purpose is to place before the world, plainly, succinctly, and without comment, a series of mere household events. But in their consequences, these events, they've terrified, tortured, and destroyed me. Yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me they have presented little but horror, and to many they will seem less terrible than Baruch's. Hereafter, perhaps, some intellect may be found which will reduce my phantasm to the commonplace. Some intellect more calm, more logical, and far less excitable than my own which will perceive, in the circumstances that I detail with awe, nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects. From my very infancy I was often noted for the docility and humanity of my disposition. My tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions. I was always especially fond of animals, and I was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets. It was with these that I would spend most of my time, and never was so happy as when feeding and caressing them. This peculiarity of character grew with my growth, and, in my manhood, I derived from it one of my principal sources of pleasure. To any of those who have cherished an affection for a faithful and sagacious dog, well, I need hardly be at the trouble of explaining the nature, or even the intensity, of the gratification thus derivable. There is something in the unselfish and self-sacrificing love of a brute. It goes directly to the heart of him who has had frequent occasion to test the paltry friendship and gossamer fidelity of mere man. The man married early in his life to a wife with similar traits to his own. She saw his fondness for animals and delighted at the possibilities they could achieve with the animals living in the house. Soon they found themselves living with birds, goldfish, a brood of a dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. The cat was a larger animal, for that of its species, and stunning. It was entirely black and sagacious, to the degree that a cat can be. Did you know that all black cats are witches in disguise? Is it so? So they say. Have you seen... Pluto. This was the cat's name. He's my favorite pet and my playmate. I alone fed him, and he would attend me wherever I went about the house. It was even with difficulty that I could prevent him from following me through the streets. Pluto today? <coughs> ah, there he is. Our friendship lasted, uh, Pluto, that is, in this manner for several years, during which my general temperament and character, through the instrument 
brutality of the fiend intemperance, had, uh, I blush to confess it, experienced a radical alteration for the worse. I grew, day by day, more moody, more irritable, and more regardless of the feelings of others. I suffered myself to use intemperate language to my wife, and at length I even offered her personal violence. My pets, of course, they were also made to feel the change in my disposition. Not only did I neglect them, I ill-used them. For Pluto, however, I still retained sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him, as I made no scruple of maltreating the rabbits, the monkey, or even the dog, when by accident or through affection they would come in my way. But my disease, it grew upon me. For what disease is like alcohol? And at length even Pluto, who was now becoming old and consequently somewhat peevish, even Pluto began to experience the effects of my ill temper. <coughs> no, no, not, not now. Oh, beseech me, Pluto, leave, hither away. Pluto! <coughs> ah! When the man sees the cat in his drunken state, the creature bit back. The fury of a demon possessed the man, and he knew not himself any more. He took from his waistcoat pocket a penknife, opened it, and grasped the poor beast by the throat. Then he tore through the cat's eye socket, cutting out one of its eyes. When reason returned to the man the next morning, he experienced the horror of what he had done. Half remorse for the crime which he was guilty of, yet half of his soul untouched. Soon he found the memory forgotten behind another olive-colored bottle. In the meantime, the cat slowly recovered. The socket of the lost eye presented, it is true, a frightful appearance, but he no longer appeared to suffer any pain. He went about the house as usual, but as might be expected, fled in extreme horror at the man's approach. I had so much of my old heart left as to be at first grieved by this evident dislike on the part of a creature which had once so loved me. So, this feeling, it soon gave place to irritation, and then came, as if to my final and irrevocable overthrow, the spirit of perverseness. Of this spirit, philosophy takes no account, yet, I am not more sure that my soul lives than I am that perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart, one of the indivisible primary faculties or sentiments which give direction to the character of man. Who has not a hundred times found himself committing a vile or a silly action for no other reason than because he knows that he should not? Have we not a perpetual inclination, in the teeth of our best judgment, to violate that which is law, merely because we understand it to be such? This spirit of perverseness, I say, came to my final overthrow. It was this unfathomable longing of the soul to vex itself, to offer violence to its own nature, to do wrong for the wrong's sake only that urged me to continue and finally to consummate the injury that I had inflicted upon the unoffending brute. Good morning. Good morrow. I'll be traveling to town. Very well. <sighs> be careful today. Watch yourself. I shall. Pluto! Pluto! Hither here! Good. Pluto, do you see this rope? I have likened it to a noose for you. Let us go to this tree. 
Good Pluto. On the day succeeding the fire, I visited the ruins. The walls, with one exception, had fallen in. This exception was found in a compartment wall, not very thick, which stood about the middle of the house, and against which had rested the head of my bed. The plastering had here, in great measure, resisted the action of the fire a fact which I had attributed to its having been recently spread. About this wall a dense crowd were collected, and many persons seemed to be examining a particular portion of it with very minute and eager attention. I approached and saw, as if graven in base relief upon the white surface, the figure of a gigantic cat. The impression was given with an accuracy truly marvellous. There was a rope about the animal's neck. When I first beheld this apparition, for I could scarcely regard it as less, my wonder and my terror were extreme. But at length reflection came to my aid. The cat, I remembered, it had been hung in a garden adjacent to the house. Now, upon the alarm of fire, this garden, it had been immediately filled by the crowd, by some one of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree and thrown through an open window into my chamber. This had probably been done with the view of arousing me from sleep. The falling of the other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the substance of the freshly spread plaster, the lime of which, with the flames and the ammonia from the carcass, had then accomplished the portraiture as I saw it. For months I could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat, and during this period there came back into my spirit a half-sentiment that seemed, but was not, remorse. I even went so far as to regret the loss of the animal, and to look about me, among the vile haunts which I now habitually frequented, for another pet of the same species, and of somewhat similar appearance, with which to supply its place. One night the man sat half stupefied in a den when his attention was drawn to something like that of a shadow. It was a black cat, a very large one fully as large as Pluto, and quite resembling him in every respect but one. Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite splotch of white covering nearly the whole region of the breast. How very queer. <coughs> Shall I touch you? This, then, this is the creature of which I search. Well, I must purchase it at once of the landlord. But the landlord made no claim of it, knowing nothing of the creature, having never seen it before. So the man continued his caresses, and when the man began his journey home, the creature hithered to his heel and joined his company. Upon arrival, it became an immediate favorite of the man's wife. A new one? Indeed. He's just like Pluto. Indeed. And he's missing an eye just like Pluto. How lovely. Indeed. In time, 
I soon found a dislike to the creature arising within me. This was just the reverse of what I had anticipated. But I, I know not how or why it was. Its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed. And by slow degrees, these feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into the bitterness of hatred. I avoided the creature. A very certain sense of shame, and the remembrance of my former deed of cruelty, preventing me from physically abusing it. I did not, for some weeks, strike or otherwise violently ill-use it. But gradually, very gradually, I came to look upon it with unutterable loathing, and to flee silently from its odious presence, as from the breath of a pestilence. Oh, honey, do you see that white mark upon its breast? Yes. Why, he appears to be aging. The mark grows with each passing day. Indeed. Look how he sits upon your lap. Good kitty. Hmm. I shall go prepare dinner. Want not for me. I shan't. You disgusting creature! Leave! Meow. Your mark! It... it resembles... it resembles a gallows! Away, demon! The man cast the cat aside and hurried to the kitchen. <coughs> Later the man took a drink and wandered deep into his thoughts. A brute beast! Whose fellow that I had contemptuously destroyed! A brute beast! To work out for me! For me, a man, fashioned in the image of the high god, so much of insufferable woe. Alas, neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest any more. Later that night. I started, hourly, from dreams of unutterable fear, to find the hot breath of the thing upon my face, and its vast weight, an incarnate nightmare that I had no power to shake off incumbent eternally upon my heart. Beneath the pressure of torments such as these, the feeble remnant of the good within me succumbs. Evil thoughts become my sole intimates, the darkest and most evil of thoughts. Soon, the moodiness of my usual temper increased to hatred of all things and of all mankind, while from the sudden, frequent, and ungovernable outbursts of a fury to which I soon blindly abandoned myself. My uncomplaining wife, alas, was the most usual and the most patient of sufferers within the days. One day the man's wife accompanied him upon some household errand into the cellar of the old building which their poverty compelled them to inhabit. The meat is in the ice container. We shall cook it up tonight. Yes, very well. The cat followed the man down the deep stairs and exasperated him to madness. Lifting an axe and forgetting in his wrath the childish dread which had hitherto stayed his hand, he aimed a blow at the animal which, of course, would have proved instantly fatal had it descended as he wished. Damned beast! Stay away! To the night's Platonian shore with you, craven! <sighs> Stop! Don't harm him! You harlot! You dare stay my hand? What has he done to you? This feline is fine. Foul witch! Oh, my God! My God, what have I done? Lenore! The axe was buried deep into his wife's brain. She fell dead upon the spot without a groan. <gasps> This hideous murder was accomplished, and the man set to the task of concealing the body. He knew that he could not remove it from the house, either by day or by night, without the risk of being observed by the neighbors. Many projects entered his mind. I'll, I'll dismember it, and, and then I shall burn it in the fire. N no, no, no. I, I shall dig a grave for it in, in the floor of the cellar. I, yes, no... No. Um, 
Perhaps the well in the yard. Uh, oh, of course not. I'll be seen. Perhaps if I pack it into a box, like merchandise, and get a porter to take it from the house. Mm, no. I must be more clever than this. No. Of course. I've got it! I will wall it up in the cellar, as if one of the monks in the Middle Ages. For a purpose such as this, the cellar was well adapted. Its walls were loosely constructed, and had lately been plastered through with a rough plaster which the dampness of the atmosphere had prevented from hardening. Moreover, in one of the walls was a projection caused by a false chimney, or a fireplace that had been filled up and made to resemble the rest of the cellar. I make no doubt that I could readily displace the bricks at this point, insert the corpse, and wall the hole up as before, so that no eye could detect anything suspicious. And in his calculation he was not deceived. By means of a crowbar he easily dislodged the bricks, and having carefully deposited the body against the inner wall, he propped it up in that position, while with little trouble he relayed the whole structure as it originally stood. Having procured mortar, sand, and hair with every possible precaution, he prepared a plaster which could not be distinguished from the old, and with this he very carefully went over the new brickwork. When he had finished, he felt satisfied that it was all right. The wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed. The rubbish on the floor was picked up with the minutest care. He looked around triumphantly, and he said to himself, Here, at least then. My labor has not been in vain. The man's next step was to look for the beast which had been the cause of so much wretchedness, for he had at length firmly resolved to put it to death. Had I been able to meet with the creature, at this very moment, there could have been no doubt of its fate. But it appears that the crafty animal has been alarmed at the violence of my previous anger, and forbade to present itself in my present mood. It is impossible to describe, or even to imagine, the deep, the blissful sense of relief which the absence of the detested creature occasioned in my bosom. It did not make its appearance during the night, and thus, for one night at least since its introduction into the house, I soundly and tranquilly slept. I slept even with the burden of murder upon my soul the second and the third day passed and still the tormentor came not upon the fourth day of the assassination a party of the police came very unexpectedly into the house and proceeded again to make rigorous investigation of the premises secure however in the inscrutability of his place of concealment he felt no embarrassment whatsoever Come, sir, accompany us. Of course. We have not a doubt of you, but we must search the premises regardless. Of course. A lovely home. Are you alone? My wife, uh, she has gone away to her parents for some time. Her mother has fallen ill. You've not gone with her? Well, I must work. Ah, of course. There's nothing of suspicion upstairs, nor on this floor. I should think that there would not be. May we check the cellar, sir? But of course, I have nothing to hide, save for some rats. I quivered, not in a muscle. My heart beat calmly, as that of one who slumbers in innocence. I walked the cellar from end to end. I folded my arms upon my bosom, and roamed easily to and fro. The police were thoroughly satisfied and prepared to depart. The glee at my heart was too strong to be restrained. I burned to say if but one word, by way of triumph, and to render doubly sure their assurance of my guiltlessness. Well, your home seems lovely, even the cellar. I wish your wife safe travels back. Nothing of suspicion here. Gentlemen, I delight to have allayed your suspicions. I wish you all health and a little more courtesy. By the by, gentlemen, this, 
This is a very well-constructed house. Hmm. Indeed. I may say, an excellently well-constructed house. These walls... Uh, oh, are you going, gentlemen? Th these walls are solidly put together. Sir, your cane. Something the matter? The man staggered to the opposite wall. For one instant, the party upon the stairs remained motionless through extreme horror and awe. In the next, a dozen stout arms were toiling at the wall. It fell bodily. The corpse, already greatly decayed and clotted with gore, stood erect before the eyes of the spectators. Upon its head, with red extended mouth and solitary eye of fire, sat the hideous beast whose craft had seduced the man into murder, and whose informing voice had consigned him to the hangman. The man had walled the monster up within the tomb. Thank you for listening to this month's production of Retrospection Radio. This episode was based off Edgar Allan Poe's famous story, The Black Cat. I'm Ursula Vane, and I have been your narrator tonight. To see who was featured in our cast, check out the description below. If you like this podcast, you can find us at www.retrospectionradio.com or on Spotify, Podbean, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and many more. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Want to contact us? Get on our emailing list? Have any ideas or suggestions? Email us at retrospectionradio at gmail.com. No caps or spaces.